Well, welcome and good morning, wherever you're watching from. I am so glad you could join us as we start a brand new series. Uh, We are starting a series about wisdom, and we're going to be looking at the book of Proverbs. If you want to grab your Bibles now and open up to chapter one of Proverbs, that'll help get you prepared. Uh, I wanted to start by asking the question, though, uh, what do you fear? Like, what makes you tremble? I'm curious. Is it traffic? Does that make you tremble? Is the fear of driving in large amounts of traffic or is it spiders? Is it planes, small spaces that confine you? Is it heights? What makes you tremble? For me, it's heights. The funny thing is in a helicopter, when I was in the military, I would hang out of the back of a helicopter for fun, way up above and it didn't bother me. But boy, you get me in a glass elevator in a building, two, three stories, doesn't matter. I am holding on to the rail, sometimes feeling like I better sit down and my knees literally shake. It's just this fear overtakes me. And I think, I don't want this feeling. I don't like it, but I can't overcome it. And some of you, you're looking at this this logo, this picture of the wisdom, the picture of wisdom that we're using. And some of you have fear just by looking at that. Some of you look at the child and you go, I remember the first time I rode a bike and it scared me. Some of you are looking at the father in this picture thinking, I remember trying to teach my kids and it scared me. And some of you look at it and go, there's a real problem that I see. I didn't see it. This kid doesn't have a helmet. And some of you are like, can't believe, how would you use that as a picture? Well, maybe we can look at it this way. Maybe the father has all the knowledge of helmets, but not the wisdom of how to apply it. And today we're going to be talking about the difference between understanding or knowledge and true wisdom that comes from the scripture. And we're going to look at that. And we start off just an understanding of where this comes from, these, these words that we're going to look at from this guy, King Solomon. Now, If you don't know much about King Solomon, he was well known in history for uh, his wealth, for his success as a king. He was instrumental in completing the temple that his father David did not finish and was handed over to Solomon. But there's this amazing moment in 1 Kings where Solomon's now in the position of being the king and in his humbleness goes to God and says, man, I don't know how to do this. And he asks for something that God responds to. He asks for wisdom of how to discern, how to lead. And I love what God says. He, he says, well, since you asked not for wealth and not for you know, me to destroy enemies, since you asked for a discerning heart, I'm going to give you a heart of wisdom, a discerning heart like has never been before and will ever be again. So we're going to glean information through the book of Proverbs from King Solomon, who's perhaps known now as the wisest man who ever lived. I think it would be wise of us to listen to somebody who was given that much wisdom from God. And I kind of start with this interesting handing off of the baton. So I, this is uh, King David speaking from uh, first, uh, first Chronicles. There's this moment where King David is handing off his lineage to his son Solomon. And here's what he says. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father. Acknowledge him and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So here's the father handing off to the son, King Solomon. Pursue God, seek him because he can be found. And then we jump into Proverbs. If you want to open up Proverbs 1. And now we have Solomon continuing this, this idea of seeking God. We see that God gives him wisdom. And then through the, through the work of God, through Solomon, we get penned in the words of God through Solomon and with the influence of Solomon. It's, it's a, a, a cool thing that we get wisdom. We get a chance to read what wisdom really looks like. So follow with me as I read from Proverbs 1, verse 1. It says this, the Proverbs of King Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, 
for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables and saying and riddles of the wise. wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. We begin with an opening about what this book is intended to do. It's to give you an opportunity to engage with God, to learn wisdom from God, because wisdom is a character of God. One of the the problems, though, is we read Proverbs, and if we read it and study it, we might think that these are uh, like equations. If I do this, this will happen. These are not promises but they are guidance for our living. There's no guarantees here. But I'll tell you, if you learn to live in God's moral universe, if you learn to live in relationship with God by reading Proverbs, by studying scriptures, by learning the wisdom of God, I believe you will do well. And not everybody has the perfect life because they follow God that we think is perfect. And not everybody uh, doesn't have a problem. Nobody, you know, people don't escape problems of the world. But ultimately, what we realize is that as if I can learn to live with God in relationship with him, my life is better. It is better. It's better for people around me too. It's a benefit both ways. And so I want to start with a key phrase that came out of that, which is fear of the Lord. It is really the beginning of this. As it said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning. And when we finished our series just last weekend, Pastor Paul, he brought us at the end of Hebrews 12. And look what it says in that. It says, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. This concept of fearing the Lord is one that people wrestle with. It's one that I think is a challenge. And and I love how Pastor Paul, last week he used this, this analogy of the two mountains, this Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. These two different uh, ways in which God was seen. And I, I look at it perhaps in a little different way. Same idea. I love coins. I love collecting them. Like, I don't have a display, but every time I travel, I love to pick up coins in the areas and the countries I go to. And it, it intrigues me what you see on coins. But one of the things that I also know about a coin is I can look at one side and I can flip it over and look at the other side, but the value didn't change. The, the coin represents its value, it re, no matter what side I'm looking at. And I was thinking about God and, and, a, and the idea of a coin. One side of the coin we look at is judgment, God's judgment and wrath. And I, I love the, the verbiage that comes from the Israelites as they literally trembled at the foot of Mount, Mount Sinai. Don't even touch it, right? It, they trembled. And I think we should have a, a, a respect that is deeper than just, oh God, you're great. I respect you. I think we do need to have a clarity that he is the God of all creation. This is a God that speaks and creation happens. It it says in in Isaiah that he marks the heavens with the width of his hand, that distance from the, the thumb to the pinky. That's how he measures stuff. This is a God who is the judge, who will have the final say, And all will come to him and he will make the perfect judgments. And all these judgments rest on his perfection. He's holy. He's perfect. He's blameless. And sometimes we don't really like to look at that side of the coin because if we really get it, it should bring us to a level of fear. I think that when we read the scripture, every time just an angel approaches a human They fall to their knees. And the angel repeatedly always says, hey, 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 hold on. (laughs) Fear not. Don't fear. So what will it be like when we stand before a holy God? I think we just need to have a picture of that because then you flip the coin over and then there's that picture that many of us hold on to. And with good reason is we see the cross and we see God's love and his mercy, his grace. 
and we like that side of the coin because that's the love that I want. But, but the fact is that God did not send Jesus Christ to die on a cross so he could love us. He came because he loves us. And when we look at that cross, what we see is God pouring out the punishment meant for you and me. So that cross is the, the image of what, it, what death brings. It brings suffering. It brings the end of relationship. But the cross is hope and it's life. And so as I hold this coin, I kind of have to go back and forth. I can't ignore the back side of the coin, the judgment side. I can't only focus on the judgment side and forget about the grace that's been given. I hold them both in, in, in balance and intention. So, so maybe I hold it this way. And I look and I realize that it's God regardless of the side. He loves me even in judgment. He loves me even at the cross. He loves me. This is God. He's, he's both. He's, he's not separate. He can't be separated. I believe when we have a deeper understanding of his judgment, it gives us a greater appreciation for his grace. And I think we're going to use the term fear of the Lord. And I, it is challenging. We read scripture and, and you hear fear the Lord. And then somewhere else says fear not. And then perfect love drives out fear. And you hear all these back and forths. But I think they're meant to be held in tension. That I do not have to, to tremble at the feet of, of our Savior now. I don't have to because if I've received his mercy and grace, I am now confident in that and I can approach him with confidence. But I need to hold those carefully. Let's take a look at Proverbs 2. If you want to turn there for a moment. Let's take that idea of the coin, but let's, let's go further. It says this, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands with you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight, if you cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as you look for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. One of the things I love about the Proverbs is it makes it clear. The pursuit of God and his wisdom is attainable. He desires to give you his wisdom. The first thing that I see is that the fear of the Lord requires humility. It requires humility. It requires the simple phrase, I believe there's a God and it is not me. To begin to step in to understand that acknowledging who he is, that I was created with a purpose by him, and that I'm called to humble myself to him. The fear of the Lord requires humility. Look what it says in Proverbs 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Two key words, trusting and submitting. Those are hallmarks, I believe, of humility. I trust God that you know better than me. I trust that you're real. I trust that you have a plan. Submitting, humbly, I come before you and I ask God, I ask for your wisdom. I ask for your forgiveness. I realize that, that I have been sinful and I'm in desperate need of your mercy in my life. See, if we want wisdom, we have to start at the beginning with fear. I have to get a picture of who this God is that I'm approaching. And I think we oftentimes kind of flippantly step into a conversation with God. Hey, I'm going to pray now, God. Just uh, how are you doing today? And I have these needs and I'll just tell them to you. And although he's willing to listen, I believe, I think we need to come with reverence and awe. As it said in Hebrews, for he is a consuming fire. That we don't become flippant. When I think of humility kind of want to ask the question, how are you doing at humbling yourself? How are you doing at submitting to him? Are there things in your life where you think, I think I have a better plan? I think that the wisdom I've obtained as a human is far better than what God has to offer. 
or are you willing to submit to God's plan? Can't tell you the number of times in my life where I thought I had it figured out only to find out that God knew better. You know, if I, if I think about times in my life where, in fact, as I was kind of being called into ministry, I had been teaching for 12 years in the public schools, and God was wrestling, and I was wrestling, <laughs> and I was pushing back saying, I don't think so. I, I don't think you know what's best for me, God. I don't, I, 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 in my mind, I think it's true, but the way I'm acting, I'm not sure. And I remember there was a kind of a step of humility that had to be taken where, where I went to God and I just said, okay, if this is really what you're calling to, then I'm going to trust you today. And I remember that stepping out of the education system and all the different areas I was working. And I remember the first day that I served and I was stepping into youth ministry. And one of my first tasks was to take a bunch of teenagers to the lake for the day. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe that, like, honestly, that I was getting to do this. And that was now part of my job, my life. And I remember I came home and my wife, she says, how was your day? And I, I couldn't believe it. I got to go play at the lake and build a relationship with kids. That's what I got to do today. She goes, yeah, you did. And the next day I was, I was heading off to work and I go, yep, heading off to work. And she goes, no, no, you, you get to go. It's like, man, my wife is so wise. <laughs> She's right. I get to serve. But there's some humility that was necessary in my life to, to begin to trust God, to begin to trust him with my life as well. So how are you doing it? Trusting God. Are you trusting him with your finances? I know it can be rocky at times. Are you trusting him with your kids? Are you trusting him with your life? The second thing I see is that the fear of the Lord leads to life. This one is just as straight out as you can get. Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. And some will grab this proverb and say, oh, so if I fear the Lord and I submit to him humbly, then I can rest and I'll never have trouble. Well, that's what it said. But I believe there's more to it. Now, when you follow God, I believe that you do find more rest. As you start to live in his moral universe, under his wisdom, attaining, just striving to, to love him, and you start to make wise decisions in life, I think you rest better. If I were a thief, I would struggle to rest at night. <laughs> and as I choose to follow God and, and, and stealing isn't a part of my life, I can rest. I think there's just good, good wisdom there. But I believe it's deeper too. I believe that we will all find that our eternal future with God will be trouble-free. There's no more sickness, no more pain. I mean, this is, these are good things. Those sounds like there's no more trouble. I think there's, there's a vision of the future, eternity with God, and there's practical implications for how I will live on earth today, that I will rest better. And I won't find trouble that I might find if I choose to live unwisely. I remember back when I was a kid, I grew up in the Catholic Church. And I find it interesting because, you know, we're wrestling with this difference between knowledge and wisdom. We're, we're kind of going through this. I, I grew up uh, aware of who Jesus was through Catholic school, through uh, different things that I went through so I could receive communion, through attending church. I was very clear in knowledge of God. I, I believed that Jesus was the only way. I believed that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, these unique persons of God. I, I, I believed all that, but you wouldn't see that in the outpouring of my life, though. I realized that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of life, is more than just a salvation moment. I had an opportunity. I looked at this and I said, wow, I can attain this new life by humbly submitting to God. I can attain new life by admitting and fearing God well to understand that fear, to see him for who he really is, or I can hold on to my old life. It drives me crazy that there are people who don't follow God and it seems like their lives are so good. Man, it seems like 
finances go their way and their kids are healthy and their cars are nice and all these things. I feel like there were times in my life where I wrestled with that. But I came to realize, as you read the Proverbs, there's a a short road that leads to that. It's this life that we live on earth, this old life that, that I could live it. God says, you can live that old life if you want, but it will lead to destruction. But if you fear the Lord, it leads to life. Not only life now, but life eternal. I have lived so much more life, I believe, since I surrendered my life to Christ. I've enjoyed so much more of life on earth than I was before. So I hope that as you think about, where are you? Are you at a a crossroad, perhaps? Are you looking at a choice, a decision? There's old life and there's new life. Which one would I like? Well, it's going to start with surrender and then pursuing God. And it really comes to this kind of the culmination of today is this idea. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I can deepen my relationship with God. When I fear him and I humbly submit to him, he accepts me in, and now I can build a relationship with the living God. It also helps me, why should I pursue wisdom then? Why do I want this? It also helps fulfill the purpose God has for me. As I read his Proverbs, as I study and build relationship with God, as I live in his moral universe in tandem with him, desiring to be in relationship with him, I start to realize that there's life in this and there's wisdom in it. I want to attain his wisdom. And he says, seek and you're going to find it. You can attain this, pursue it. And you will start to find that your life is pretty wonderful when you're with me. It says in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. With an understanding of pursuit now of wisdom, I can begin to live this life. I can navigate it more successfully. True wisdom is learning the boundaries between good and evil and building a relationship with God. Learning those boundaries That's what wisdom is helping us to understand. What is evil and why shouldn't I do that? What is good and why should I pursue that? I don't think any of us would argue that living wisely, living for the good of life, (laughs) would be a wrong thing to do. In fact, it kind of intrigues me. I think, I believe, that people can read Proverbs, uh, apply the ideas into their life and have a very good, successful life on earth. But the difference is when I pursue God with this, when I fear the Lord, when I don't just take the book, look at it and say, oh, that's a good idea. When I pursue God, that he fills me with his spirit, gives me the ability to begin to live out the wise things. And at the very end, I believe there are people who would have benefited by just reading Proverbs and they would have had a good life. But there's a problem. The fear of the Lord leads to life. It leads to wisdom. And I believe that we have to understand when I, when I grab this coin, when I hold this coin, The fear of the Lord reminds me of something. It reminds me that I was bought with a price. The shed blood on the cross. The fear of the Lord reminds me there are people around me that do not yet know Jesus. So it's not a trembling fear, but I think it's a good reminding. And I am in awe of a God who speaks things into existence. I want to worship God with that much reverence. I'm so grateful I don't have to fear him today but I don't want to lose sight of what fear means. See what I mean? It's this difficult balance of of how do we do that. I want you to think of wisdom as an attribute of God. Fear reminds us of others. When we make wise decisions, when we're generous, when we're sexually, uh, have sexual integrity, when we, when we are, uh, hold on to the good things of that are good and just and right 
this is what wisdom is the product of. These are the attributes of God. And he says, live in this way. You can attain this by following me. So I came up kind of with a working definition, just thinking through. Wisdom is knowledge in action. Wisdom is knowledge in action. You can have good knowledge of Proverbs. Wisdom is when you begin to actually apply it. So, you know, Ken said it this way. You can have the knowledge that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom says don't put it in the fruit salad. (laughs) You can have the knowledge that quicksand is dangerous, but wisdom says walk around it. (laughs) A long ways. You can have wisdom. The stove is hot. That was my first word as a kid, hot, because I touched the stove. Wisdom says don't touch the stove. I learned. (laughs) I gained wisdom. You can have the knowledge that God is real, but wisdom says, I'll surrender to him. I'll love him. I'll follow him. Wisdom is knowledge in action. And God desires that you would seek his wisdom. So how are you doing at seeking wisdom? I hope that as we go through the book of Proverbs, you are challenged not only to engage in God's word, but to begin to use it as a tool to evaluate your life. It's designed to be a reference. As King Solomon brought these, these words together, as, and there's some other writers involved at the last two chapters, as they compiled this, this knowledge and wisdom, and as God directed it, he says, now it's at your disposal. Investigate, pursue, and it will be given to you. I think it's worth noting there's kind of, this is a, a piece of a bigger puzzle and why, why it's so important to read the scriptures and understand them. There's kind of three main books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Kind of look at it this way. We have Proverbs that gives us wisdom, what it looks like. And then we have Ecclesiastes, which is an interesting book, as it's Solomon, who has attained wealth, had multiple wives, experienced everything, and then he, he comes to these famous phrases, it's all vanity. Without Christ, it's hopeless. Without God, there's nothing but riches and fame and the end. (laughs) With God, there's hope and there's life. And then we get Job, and Job is this amazing story, and we kind of combine these together to call the biblical wisdom literature. And Job has this moment where you see him suffer, and yet the wisdom of Solomon, the reality of what it looks like in Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new. It's all vanity. It's practically lived out as he navigates a difficult journey of a loss of family, loss of wealth, and yet God is still there. We see the wisdom at at play. It's good to take these three books and perhaps even as we go through Proverbs, maybe you'll find some time and, and read into those as well and, and see how do those help shape a fuller picture of what it means to really follow God, to really understand that these Proverbs are powerful, wonderful, great wisdom. They are the attribute of God, wisdom. They're attainable. He wants to give you wisdom, but ultimately what he wants is relationship with you. So I'm going to hand off to our campus pastors. And if you're online, I've got something for you to watch just to kind of bring you to closure. Thanks for joining us today.